deep within the National Archives of the United Kingdom, a large collection of letters from the late 1960s are kept. Other than the letter writers, few have seen them. But in 1997, selected batches of these top secret British internal letters were released to the public. They reveal a pivotal moment in the history of Singapore's reserves. The year was 1967, just four years after Singapore was freed from British colonial rule. Singapore was still part of the Stirling area. This meant that along with more than 50 other countries, Singapore was obliged to hold most, if not all, of its national reserves in pound sterling. But in November that year, Singapore released a press statement to the public, which dropped a bombshell. It revealed that it had been diversifying half of its reserves into other currencies. The press statement was just three pages long, but the announcement came as a huge shock to Great Britain. So much so that hundreds of letters were written discussing Singapore's controversial move. So these are documents uh, from the British National Archives regarding Singapore's diversification efforts. So about 80% of these documents consist of internal correspondence between British officials. About 20% uh, would be the correspondence between Singapore officials and British officials. So this letter was sent by Roy Jenkins, at that time the Chancellor of the Exchequer of the UK government, to Dr Goh King Sui, who was Singapore's finance minister. So large a move in the non-sterling assets by a member country of the sterling area place a heavy burden on the whole system. It is also likely to encourage others to follow. Frankly, I regret that your government did not take us into their confidence in making the moves which have now been announced, or indeed, in taking the decision to announce them. So in this case, he is saying rather indirectly that Singapore should you know, take the sterling area as, as a matter of great concern. Um, when we think of Britain in the 60s, we quite often associate it with the swinging 60s, which is this time of great cultural excitement, uh, social progressiveness. But economically, uh, for the British, they were really struggling with an economy that was far less dynamic than others globally. And this led to the perception quite widely, both within Britain and beyond, that Britain was no longer very competitive on the world stage. The British economy at the time was consuming far more than it was producing, which meant that pounds were being converted into other currencies and flowing out so that the Brits could buy all kinds of imported goods. But globally, few wanted British goods, which meant the pound wasn't in demand. This could lead to a devaluation of the currency. It thus really helps Britain that the sterling area countries were then dutifully soaking up the pound for their reserves. Being a former British colony, Singapore too was part of the sterling area. But it decided it would move towards keeping half of its reserves in US dollars and other currencies instead of in sterling. When we diversified, the British saw it as infamy. Because at the time of crisis 67, there were magnified the crisis that Britain was facing. It's just pouring oil on, in fire. That's how they saw it. In diversifying its reserves, Singapore was actually taking a gamble since it was in a bit of a sticky situation with Britain at the time. When the British were looking to cut spending, one of the biggest issues that came up was their defence budget and the fact that the British government had been maintaining bases and troops in places like Singapore, in Hong Kong as well, in the Far East. And this was increasingly difficult to sustain. By 1967, the British government had decided to withdraw its commitment to what it saw as its Far East command. 
In the case of Singapore, the military presence was quite extensive. We're talking about a number of uh, airfields, military bases and shipyards. A lot of locals would have been employed on these bases in support roles, as cooks, as maintenance and repairs, for instance. It represented about 20% of the GDP for Singapore. With the withdrawal of troops, uh, you, you have around 25,000 employees who would be made redundant, essentially. These shots show a send-off parade marking the withdrawal of British forces from Singapore. To mitigate the fallout, the British promised to provide Singapore significant financial aid. So incurring the wrath of Britain probably wasn't a good idea at the time. Now this particular letter, sort of internal correspondence between officials of the finance ministry uh, in, in the UK is quite indicative of uh, what the British officials actually think privately regarding Singapore. Singapore turns out to be immensely more rich in reserves than we knew. She has diversified. We simply cannot sit idly by and let large sums of aid be, in, in effect, diversified in future. British officials were divided on how to respond to Singapore's diversification exercise. Some strongly felt that Britain should withhold aid from Singapore until its pound reserves were reconstituted, while others took a more sympathetic stance. So in terms of real politics, certainly Singapore is disadvantaged, right? We were still dependent on British for foreign aid, and Dr Goh was very well aware of this. Dr Goh Keng Sui was Singapore's finance minister at the time, which meant he oversaw everything related to the reserves, including its diversification. So why did Singapore risk much-needed financial aid from Britain just to diversify its reserves? To understand, let's go back a century, when the British first arrived in Singapore. As a free port, Singapore could not collect taxes on the trade. So even though the trade can go into billions of dollars and pounds, we earn nothing from it. So what the British did is set up a system where they raised the funds locally, introduced consumption taxes, opium, gambling and liquor. So we can fund the government. These taxes contributed to government revenue, which is needed to fund government expenditure. Any extra money that the government did not use would be a surplus, which became Singapore's reserves. Since Singapore was then part of a British colony, the British decided that these reserves should be invested in Britain in some long-term securities and equities so that the government could earn more money through investment returns. These government reserves loosely formed one set of Singapore's reserves and was used to fund government activities such as development projects. But Singapore also had a separate pool of reserves under the currency board. Reserves to back the currency. These are some of the examples of the old currencies. The Straits Settlements notes was the first paper currency introduced in the Straits Settlements. After the war, we created the Malaya and Borneo notes. We call this the Queen's dollar because of Queen Elizabeth's image there. This Malayan and British Borneo dollar, through a common currency agreement, was used in various British colonies such as Singapore, Malaya, North Borneo and Brunei. The transition started with Malaya becoming independent in 1957. They demanded that the currency be changed from being a British currency into a local Malayan currency. So that's why all the notes changed from the British motors to the Malay motors of that year. So we created this after 1960. This Malayan and British Borneo dollar replaced the earlier Queen's dollar. It was issued by the Malayan and British Borneo Currency Board, which was responsible for ensuring confidence in the currency by backing it with reserves in pounds. This ensured that if you held, say, 60 Malayan dollars, you could definitely exchange it for 7 British pounds, which was the fixed exchange rate at the time. Then, in 1965, a turning point for Singapore. 
that upon the separation of Singapore from Malaysia, the government of Malaysia shall relinquish its sovereignty and jurisdiction in respect of Singapore. Right, although we separated from Malaysia in 65, the common currency agreement continues. We have to decide whether we still want to have a common currency in Malaysia. And so, three months after separation, in an effort to minimise trade disruption between Singapore and Malaysia, Singapore's Finance Minister Lim Kim San initiated negotiations with his Malaysian counterpart Tan Siu Sin to extend the common currency arrangement. But from the outset, Dr Goh was sceptical that the negotiations would work out. This is Dr Goh on the SS Carthage going from Singapore to London to study economics. As a young teenager, he was living in a plantation with his father, who was a manager of a rubber estate, and he realised there was less and less food. And he asked the father what's happening. And the father explained to him that prices of rubber had plunged. And he said, but why? And his father explained that the syndicate in the UK, they were all affecting the price of rubber. He realised, OK, there are some foreigners who can even affect how much food we have on the table. So he decided to, to study economics. This need to be masters of your own destiny, to be in control, I think stayed with him. As far as Dr Goh is concerned, he could see that it would be very problematic to have a common currency with Malaysia. Looking back, I think a common currency between two sovereign countries, in fact, is an impossibility. That's Nyam Tong Dao, who was on Singapore's side of the common currency negotiations. The team was led by Finance Minister Lim Kim San, and Dr Goh was the advisor. Because it means you got to uh, coordinate your economic, your fiscal and monetary policies uh, very closely. And I think the, the needs of the Malaysian economy and ours are quite different. But more than the differences in economic priorities, this 88-page white paper in 1966 laid out what Singapore was most concerned about. The safety of their foreign exchange reserves. You see, at that time, since Malaysia and Singapore shared a common currency, their currency backing reserves were also pooled together. But when each became separate and sovereign entities, ownership of the reserves became a bone of contention. They wanted us to hand over whatever little reserves we have to Kuala Lumpur to manage against the issue of currency. So Dr. Goh says, no, Dr. Goh says, we can have a common logo, you know, but your currency, you issue against your own reserves. Our currency, we issue against our own reserves. And the reserve will remain in our hands. But I think uh, the Malaysian finance minister could not agree to that. Malaysia decided that our reserves in the common currency union had to be placed with Megan Nagara. Bank Nagara was Malaysia's newly set up central bank. And if Singapore agreed to place the reserves under the bank's care, Singapore would have handed over legal ownership of its reserves to a central bank of another country to control and manage. We just could not accept that. We cannot have our sovereign funds in the hands of a foreign country. Even though a common currency promises better prospect into the economic development, it cannot be at the expense of sovereignty. And so, after 11 months of arduous negotiations, both the Singapore and Malaysian government announced that they could not reach agreement for a common currency. As a result, beginning from the 12th of June 1967, Singapore and Malaysia will issue their own separate currencies. Singapore's new currency Pada muka depan wang itu, ada bunga oket yang kian menjadi satu lambang atau simbol bagi Singapura. When the new notes were issued, this clip was broadcast on public television. 
informing Singaporeans about the different denominations and designs of the new Singapore dollar. As independent Singapore's first batch of notes and coins were being printed and minted, the country's share of the reserves, held mainly in sterling, was transferred over from the Malayan Currency Board. But even as Singapore was dealing with the fallout from the failed negotiations, trouble at a more international scale was brewing. This is what Britain looked like in the late 1940s. While it had emerged from the Second World War victorious, it was left with a battered economy. The war had stripped the country of virtually all its foreign reserves. But the government desperately wanted to improve standards of living, so there was considerable social spending leading to persistent trade deficits and an influx of pounds into the foreign exchange market. All of these factors tend to lead to a decline in the currency's value. On 18th November 1967, what Singapore's leaders feared happened. From now on, the pound abroad is worth 14% or so less in terms of other currencies. Before the devaluation, the pound was 2.8 to the US dollar. But after the devaluation, it became 2.4 as a fixed rate. So in other words, it became weaker and it could also buy less and change less. Though not unexpected, the evaluation, when it actually came, uh, turned out to be a painful experience to all concerned. This is hardly a, avoidable, since sterling is one of the two major reserve currencies of the world, and a considerable proportion of international trade is financed in sterling. Two main options are open to the rest of the world following upon British devaluation. First, to devalue instead of sterling. Second, to retain the then existing parity. We have to decide whether to devalue or not. If Singapore decided to devalue, this is what would happen. Instead of $8.57 Sing exchanging for $2.80 US, it could only fetch $2.40. Devaluing had its drawbacks. It meant people would lose confidence in its newly minted currency. Now remember, Singapore's currency was then barely four months old. In 1967, the priority of the Singapore government was this new dollar need to win the confidence of our trading partners as well as the locals. So despite the falling value of the pound, we decided not to devaluate our new Singapore dollar. This meant that the Singapore dollar maintained its original exchange rate to other currencies such as the US dollar. But the exchange rate between pound sterling and the Sing dollar went from $8.57 Sing to a pound to one pound 17. But here's the catch. Every Singapore dollar had to be backed by foreign reserves which was supposed to be in pound sterling since Singapore was a member of the sterling area. After devaluation, the pound was worth less. So for every 8 Singapore dollars and 57 cents in circulation, another 17 pence in reserves was needed to back it. But Singapore stuck to its gun and said we had ample reserves to cover the losses. The reason why? Singapore had, since 1966, already started to diversify out of pound sterling into all kinds of currencies. The US dollar, the Deutsche Mark, the Swiss franc, and the Japanese yen, which meant that the value of its reserves took less of a hit when sterling devalued, since the other currencies still maintained their value. It is therefore possible for the Singapore government to absorb the shock of sterling devaluation. The choice to diversify its reserves allowed Singapore to weather the storm of the sterling devaluation. But it invited British outrage, which was in full display in declassified internal memos between British officials. Cheating, cooking the books, misdeeds, Dr Goh's dark deeds behaved in a distinctly fishy way. 
These were just some of the ways which British officials described Singapore's choice to secretly diversify its reserves. While none of these memos reached Dr Goh, his exchange of letters with his UK counterpart, Chancellor Roy Jenkins, were described by some as abrasive. My dear Chancellor, our currency notes are automatically convertible into sterling on demand. As a consequence of this, following upon devaluation... We had lost, in total, about $157 million. These are substantial losses for a small, underdeveloped country to sustain. However, you may be pleased to know that neither I nor any of my colleagues have uttered a single word of recrimination against your government. That's him. That's him. Even after Singapore had diversified its reserves out of sterling, it had still lost $157 million after sterling had devalued. If the country had not diversified, its losses would have been even greater. Uh, I think Dr Goh's letter was alarming to the British in, in the sense that Singapore, being a newly independent nation, actually responded in such a bold manner to a former colonial master. Uh, Dr Goh reminded them that the British themselves were at fault for devaluing the sterling and causing Singapore to suffer certain losses. And this is really important uh, in the sense that uh, he gave the British the sense an idea of how we are still masters of our, of our own destiny, so to speak, uh, in charge of our own reserves. Singapore eventually received £50 million in aid from Britain, and both sides agreed on a minimum proportion of sterling for Singapore's reserve holdings. But Dr Goh was far from done with the reserves. He had been managing the central bank, and that's the Monetary Authority of Singapore, and he kept very close touch with what they are doing. At some point in time, he felt that the instruments they invested in were too short term and that if you trade carefully, you can have higher yields. You need the central bank to manage your monetary reserves, your currency, interest rates, but perhaps you should have a separate institution uh, whose investment philosophy is different. And so, in 1981, the Government of Singapore Investment Corporation, now known as GIC, was established. Its mandate was to grow Singapore's reserves and achieve a higher rate of return. It diversifies its investments and puts money overseas in order to preserve the international purchasing power of the reserves. Dr Goh was a chess player and if you're a chess player, you think several moves ahead. This man assiduously built up the reserves with a plan. I don't know what was the amount that the British handed us, but what he did was to build on that amount a thousandfold over a spate of 30 years. So I think that his greatest satisfaction was to build the reserves in Singapore to such a level that he could spend as he had always planned to spend. Today, GIC has offices in 10 major cities across the world and manages a portfolio that is well over 100 billion US dollars. And among countries with no natural resources, Singapore remains one of the rare ones with sizable reserves. And even rarer still, with just half of the annual returns from investing those reserves, Singapore has enough to fund up to a fifth of its yearly public spending. <laughs>